Um, we uh, have another good panel here. Uh, as I, I think the program says, green cities, myth or reality? Um, and we've got uh, uh, two guests who are probably pretty uniquely qualified to discuss this question from two very different perspectives. Uh, Mayor Daley obviously ran one of the biggest cities in the world and certainly one of the biggest cities in the United States. Um, pretty hands-on experience with questions of how do you make a city uh, green and work better and more livable. Um, Bill McDonough has been thinking, writing, speaking, doing for years um, from the sort of the architectural and I would, I would say more theoretical end, although with increasing hands-on, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so two, pers two perspectives. Um, Mayor Daly, let me start with you. I'm going to ask the same question of both of you, but let me start with you. When you talk about a, a green city or a, a city that, that, that is, um, has an environmental consciousness, but from the point of view of citizens, what are the first priorities? When you're running a city, what are the first priorities that people really want from their government in, in, in terms of a better environment to live in? Right. First of all, when I got elected in, in, in 1989, everybody thought a green city would be St. Patrick's Day painted green. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you have to look at, okay, what's the responsibility of the city? First of all, it's cleanliness. That alone, you know, pick from up the, the airport, pick up, but everything around, the parks, everything is a program, and not just the city, it's the private sector, it's the community block clubs, all of them dealing with the cleanliness of the city. And then after that, how do you really show people the differences? You start doing landscaping. You put a landscape committee, you start finding out, start uh, basically uh, planting trees. Mm -hmm. and to get the community involved, a reentry program, a program that people have not worked and get them involved in a training program. And then you're doing a social conscience and then you're basically helping the environment. Then you had to tell them why you're planting trees. And you had to explain how important that is to the air quality. And then after that... Who's against planting trees? Well, you'd be surprised. Everybody said that media came, you know, you have to cut your budget, cut that first. Uh, uh, the media said, uh, why are you spending money on trees? Uh, you're just beautifying the city. And that's what they explained, but you have to explain to them how environmentally important that is. And then after that, then you have to have the city lead by example. Usually government mandates everybody else to do it and exempts themselves. So what we try to do is we said, we're going to start being a, a green uh, government. And what we did is every building is certified uh, dealing with the U.S. Building uh, Council. Uh, we have the first platinum public building. All public buildings are basically built uh, with the U.S. Green uh, Building Council. Then after that, then we have a green center of technology to educate developers, architects, engineers, contractors, trade associations, and unions how important environment is in regards to the new technology coming into retrofitting buildings, building new buildings, adapting your code to the new technology. Uh, if they're going to uh, build green, give them a special permit to do that as quickly as possible. And then, of course, you look at the water situation in conservation, what type of building, what they're doing inside the building. And the, the public it wants it but they don't understand sustainability. They can't figure out what it is, but they want someone to lead this. And from my experience, we don't have a national plan for the environment. It's basically the city or the private sector and non-for-profits doing it. And, and if we had a national plan, uh, a, just an agenda, and said, here's what it is, you may disagree or agree with it, at least we have a blueprint. And that's one of the problems that cities and, and states have. Uh, I want to, now, I want to come back to this because I want to talk to you about regulation as a helper and hindrance, but let me get to Bill McDonough. I mean, for now, you've worked on all sorts of different v versions of this problem of green buildings, green cities, green communities. You know, what's your first priority? What is the first priority as you're thinking about how to design um, a, a green community or a green building or a green factory? Uh, when you look at that problem, what do, you, what do you think of first? What has to happen first? Well, I think we need a much bigger plan, as Mayor Daly's pointed out. And so in that context, I got a call a little while ago to design a new factory in, in India. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, I sent my first sketches off that night to India. And the building, uh, it's a motorcycle factory. It'll be the largest in the world. And I, I just put the structure on the outside to keep the factory free because, you know, I build factories. 
But I, because then I could use it for solar collectors, and then in between the gang trusses, I could use it for greenhouses. And so all of a sudden, we're designing a million square feet of buildings that have as many jobs on the roof as they do inside. So you have, this, this is another- Growing food. Growing yeah. food on, on the roof. On the roof, yeah. And so it's all cost effective. Since I need the structure anyway, I can make it tall and light. It's less steel, and I get the greenhouse space. Now all the people go to work, and we make oxygen in the building instead of uh, taking air, four changes an hour, air changes an hour of desert, humid, dusty air. We actually have walls of plants that create the oxygen for the workers directly and save huge amounts of money. So, what, but what it's about is that carbon belongs in soil, not in the atmosphere. We don't have an energy problem. This whole conference is quite astonishing because we keep hearing about the energy. It's, we don't have an energy problem. We have lots of energy, that's the point. We have a materials problem, a big one. It's carbon, a material we should know and love because it's us, mm -hmm. in the atmosphere where it's a toxin. You see, a material in the wrong place is a toxin. Carbon in the atmosphere is a toxin. Too much. Wake up, smell coffee, get on with it. If you just said all toys can be painted with lead and we're going to allow that in our children's mouths, how long do you think we want to do this? Well, what do you think we're doing in the atmosphere? So if you design and you go, wait a minute, carbon is an asset, Whoosh, earthbound, go. Work, jobs, go. Fresh, healthy food, go. Water, out of the atmosphere, go. Boom. When you, when you go to clients, especially in the, de in, the, in the developing world, India and China, and I want you to talk about China, and maybe use this question to talk about China. Um, are they concerned when you, when, you, when, you, when you present an idea like this? We're going to put, we're put you know, a green roof, and we're going to have a sort of open, kind of unusual architecture. One of my first green roofs, by the way, was for him. That's right. Okay, well. City Hall, Chicago. <laughs> isn't the first response of, of these clients, that's going to cost a lot, or that's, 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 that doesn't seem functional to us. How do you get let through me, that let me, barrier? Let me focus. For Bill Ford, he asked me to redo the River Rouge. In public, he never told me in advance he was going to do it. I said, why did you give me this assignment in public without talking to me first? He said, because I could never have gotten permission. Because you've never done this And his before. name's on the building. Yeah, my name's on the building. But he, he said, let's go create shareholder value. What we did is the world's largest green roof and a landscape that was quite astonishing. What happened there is interesting. We used nature to meet the Clean Water Act. It was $48 million worth of three chemical treatment plants, four miles of pipes, and 70 auto workers standing around praying it doesn't rain. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that value for a company? So we used the green roof and so on. It was $13 million. We saved Ford $35 million. So when I had to go to the board for approval for phase one, $150 million, I came in and I said, I have a minute and a half to make this presentation. And I understand why. You're a $170 billion enterprise. You've got 11 meetings a year. This is $150 million. It's worth about a minute and a half. I get that. So I've almost used up my 30 seconds. And I'll finish by saying this project's for the birds. And that is true. OK? Mm -hmm. Now. In the last minute, since you're fiduciaries in the car business, let me point out that what we just did is saving you $35 million in CapEx, and with the Ford Taurus at a 4% margin coming out of Chicago, this is the equivalent of me walking in here and offering you an order for $900 million worth of cars. Mm -hmm. Approved. <laughs> that is how you do this. Okay. You see? So, right, and also, uh, <laughs> Ford was a good citizen in Chicago, besides uh, uh, using technology to retrain the workforce. They came one of the stewards uh, dealing with the environmental problems in and around the Ford plant. Uh, they adapted it. Uh, they put money into it and in saving uh, much of the open lands there. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you about some lessons learned, because th this doesn't always go smoothly. Bill, I think you know that. Uh, you, 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 you've got a project now in China. But I think we have some, you, yeah. yeah you, and so tell, me, tell us about your engagement with China, because you also had a project you know, a few years back in China, which, 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 as I understand it, did not really go as well oh, yeah. as you would have no, hoped. The experience is so really important. So what were the lessons you've learned in doing Well, this? first of all, I think like the Ford thing is a good example. When we went into it, you don't know what you're doing. You just know you have this desire to solve for this issue. So we found that green, green roof technology in Germany, and it had been used by the Stasi for, for camouflage, because we needed something light and cheap, you know? In China, I've had some very amazing lessons. One was a little village that where we went in and, and we were doing it mostly pro bono, trying to help out. And they said, can you help out in the little village? And the person who was in charge of it, the local mayor developer, just went off and did this crazy thing and built 40 houses out there and said, you know, this is it. And he didn't pay any attention to the things we were saying about let's, you know, develop local capacity, let's figure out how the local people can build it, let's do straw, let's not just move all the farmers to the same, you know, just, they just did it. And what a lesson, because, you know, like a tar pit. And 
what you realize is, you know, I was talking to Anne-Marie Sastry earlier, and she said, you know, the thing is, intention is not execution. Mm -hmm. When you work with China, that is hugely important. Because so now you're working with China again. Is and that so right? what I insist so what, on, so what is, I'm now the client. You're at the client. I want control, and we got the money, and it's our project, and we're in charge of it. And the first thing we do is convene everybody, just like Mayor Daly did in Chicago. You bring in all the parties. You see what had happened in that village? The mayor just said, oh, I talked to everybody. This is what they all want. But we never got to talk to everybody, et cetera. They just did it, mm -hmm. and they do it fast. Because the way China, the way you got promoted right. in China, you have a five-year plan. Right. So every politi politician is doing a five-year thing, and then they're leaving it to the next mayor who has to clean it up or watch it degrade. Mm -hmm. And then the third mayor will take it over and mm -hmm. do it over again. Mm -hmm. And they all get promoted because it's five-year plans. Intention, so, intention is not execution. I guess you could say the same thing about Chicago, right? Well, yes. You need basically uh, the business community uh, become your advisors and work with them. That doesn't mean there's a difference of opinion, but they have to be part of the solution, the same way as the non-for-profits and the citizens in government. There always has to be that. Government cannot do it alone. And I've always said, in the environment, it's the land, air, and water. And from my viewpoint, government has to lead by example. And so on green roofs, we led by example. Exactly. And once we lead by example, then we have over 7 million square feet of green roofs today because they knew we were serious about this. We weren't going to mandate uh, to the uh, business, but we were going to do every public building dealing with green roofs, green environment. Everything was concerned about that, and we start cutting the cost down. And that was, that was the major issue, dealing with the cost. Then we had special service districts, uh, tax increment financing to retrofit many of the historical buildings. Otherwise, uh, most would be demolished or abandoned. So what do you do with their air conditioning, their heating? What do you do with their windows? Uh, and what do you do with their roofs and everything like that? Are, are buildings the biggest issue in terms of, of urban energy use? Or do you also have to think about the transportation grid? Do you have to think about you know, things like storm water? I mean, well, you have to think focus? about the, the construction of the buildings, especially uh, dealing with energy concerns and, and the environment. And of course, public transportation, we're building the same system we built uh, uh, 100 years ago, the same cars, same public transportation. We have to really change that. I mean, uh, China's led the way with technology from Germany and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. and so we have to adopt inner city public transportation, and that's what we have to adopt. And water conservation is very important in Chicago, even though the Great Lakes, we formed the Great Lakes uh, meeting of Canadian mayors, U.S. mayors. We found out that both Canada and the United States didn't tell anybody where they're spending the money in the Great Lakes. So we passed resolutions, both the President and both the Prime Minister of Canada has a basic public awareness. We can find out where they're spending the money on the Great Lakes. Conservation is very important. I mean, if we don't have conservation of the water, that's one of the great assets we'll lose uh, slowly but surely over the years. Bill, when you go around the world and you look at cities, um, do, do you... Who's doing it? Who's, who's got good ideas? Who's, and listen, and let's talk about, and if, if this is relevant to you, transportation. Where do you see good ideas in, in transportation that's, that's, that's not as energy intensive, not as carbon intensive? I mean, is it somewhere in Brazil? Do, is it the United States? I don't think so, by the way, the United yeah, States. Right. Where, would you, where do you see good ideas? Well, it's fascinating, given this conference, let me do a little skipping through the decades. If we <laughs> jump back to Curitiba, Brazil in 1980s, and we look at Jaime Lerner and what he was able to yeah. do, getting Volvo to make buses in Curitiba and basically build a subway system above the ground that's quite astonishing, which has then been replicated by Bogota and other people and built on. But I mean, really practical, brilliant piece of work. And also creating a new form of currency in terms of transportation, because <laughs> he could pay people to bring out their garbage in tokens for transportation. So if you couldn't afford to go to work, you could get um, you could turn in your garbage and get a token which could get you to either an organic garden that the city was building in their floodplains, or you could get to work. So you solved the trash problem as and well. And he created a new form of currency, which is quite astonishing, and, and health and food. And, I mean, amazing city. And then, and then we move on, and Bogota's taking that up, and other people, and so on. But if I could jump ahead, what I find really exciting about this conference, when you talk to people like Sunil Paul, see, what I'm interested in is the cities and our modes of transportation, highways, et cetera, have, have pulled the families apart. The families moved to the burbs, you know, for middle, their middle period, 
you know, the young people get out of college, they want to wear black and go to cities and find mates. Then they have kids and they want a swing set. And then when they get older, they're going to want to come back to the city. They don't want to be out there with a swing set, you know? So we got to bring the generations back together. And what I find fascinating is we watch people being able to live past 65. There are a few of us, you know, where I'm there getting ready. So, you know, we're good. We're good. I'm okay. So if we think about it, I would like to see us taking all these technologies with GPS and have the elders driving the children to their violin lessons using GPS. There is no reason we could not go from that bus, which is still a linear system, to an automatic delivery system of children to wonderful things all over by the elders who are driving around talking to children and hang out in you know, greenhouses growing food for the day and drinking coffee and talking to their friends instead of filing them in cabinets. So we, the generations being brought back together is the thing we destroyed could actually heal us. It's quite fascinating. Well, well, one thing, so good. You're looking at the Global Cities Initiative. You're looking around at the different parts of the world as well, right? Yeah, one of the things that public transportation, 1955, we built the expressway going west, and public transportation was built in the middle of the expressway. And when the Dan Ryan going south and the Kennedy going north, public transportation, no one followed that in the country. No one in the federal government, state governments. And then what we came when we looked at the Olympics a number of years ago, you know, what happened is we divide, divided the city uh, because of the expressway. So how about covering parts of it for parks and, and, and basically bringing communities together? And then I looked at landscaping. We landscape along the expressway. Right, it, right. And that, when you talk to engineers, you talk about landscaping, and they want to talk about concrete along the expressway. It's very interesting. And so you have Additional to, concrete. Yeah, along more it. and more. Right. You have to have the will to do it. And, and what you do is you make the communities in and around those uh, expressways feel part of it. They're, they're part of the solution in, in the landscaping, the noise. And of course, eventually, we have to cover these because you want to bring the communities together. Well, right, because in the, in the 50s, 60s, and yes. 70s, the freeways were, were basically tore the but city But that, uh, that should have been our public transportation system all the way out. So, here, so here's the problem. And, and again, I, I know you both must know this perfectly well. Where are the resources going to come from to do this kind of, to, to, cover the, to cover the freeways? Just let's use that. Where are okay. the resources come from? See, my theory is that the way we set it up, infrastructure from the federal government, and then state, then local. What you have to do is you have to have, I, I believe, a, a commission set up of some fed, state, and local, and business community, a sector, six and six, three fourths to make decisions. And how do we, where the money comes from? Offshore profits that everybody's making, and they don't want to bring it back. Bring it back at a 5% tax. Then say that you're going to contribute 15% into infrastructure fund each year. At a national level? or At a national level, okay. every company. And then X amount of money will come from local and state governments. And when there's a project going, so we're going to do a water and sewer project, not in Chicago, but in the metropolitan area, it includes Indiana and Wisconsin. And we say to ourselves, in that area, what do you require? You don't like plastic piping. Uh, you require certain laws, rules, and regulations that cost more money than anyone else. And whether it's the federal, state, and local, then you evaluate all the laws and rules and regulations that cost you more money. It's not safety. It's not better efficiency. It's, it, it, it's cost more money. So that $25 billion comes down to maybe $21 billion. Do, do, do rules and regulations that, um, and we were talking about this earlier, so I'll ask you about this. Do rules and regulations that are ostensibly, or that are aimed at helping the environment, actually help push development out into the suburbs and create more sprawl? I'm talking about sort of the, the Superfund and, and hazardous waste brownfield problems. It, it all does, uh, in a sense that EPA is not an agent that comes to work with you. It is like the FBI coming to you, knocking on your door, and you're saying, here they are. Even as a mayor, oh my God, the Justice Department's here. They're gonna file a lawsuit. They're gonna put a judgment in. They want you to do whatever, you're gonna have to raise all this money overnight. And so it, what happens is there's a, lack of, there's a lack of really cooperation. The federal, first of all, cities were formed in the country, then states, then we decided to form a country. And so what it is now is they have to evaluate. What I did as mayor, we started evaluating our laws and rules and regulations. Why do we have that law there? Well, how long has it been into effect? Why do we have the rules and regulations in each department? And then you can eliminate those, and you find out who put those in. Then you find out there's no rule or regulation it's a bureaucracy interpreting the rules and regulations. Yeah. And that's another thing they have to come with. But I think they're necessary, but you have to evaluate all of them of what the intention is the intention to do. Bill, I mean, as you were, I mean, are, are, rules, are the rules of, 
that governs city construction in cities or buildings in cities, are they a help or a hindrance as you're, if you're looking f f toward a goal of a greener city? Well, for me, I, my job as a designer is to, <coughs> is to envision the future and then render it visible if I can. So, you know, I, I, when I was asked by NASA to look at doing the Mars station, I said, wait, why, why do we go to the red planet? Why don't we go back to the blue one first? So we just finished building for the federal government, uh, NASA's new research center, uh, and it, it can produce 120% more energy than it needs from renewables and purify its own water, and it was done with a normal budget of a federal building ahead of schedule. So you want to talk about lead building, you know, less, less carbon? How about a building like a tree? See? So if you think about it, we took 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. You know, we're not that smart, really. So, <laughs> if, but if you think about like a tree, if you could do a building or a city like a forest, that's what no, he was doing, you see? When they say, what are you doing, yeah, beautification? Yeah. He was building a city like a forest. Beautification sounds like an elitist thing. Yeah. Felt like Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> yeah. No, but I see a picture of Toyota. Can you believe it? They have an ad. It's a picture of a tree, and it says, our aim, zero emissions. Yeah. You've got to be kidding. This thing's emitting oxygen, thank goodness. No, I want to leave zero emissions. I want to leave some time for questions, but I want to ask both of you, and, and I'll admit that this is a somewhat personal agenda. Um, as both of you know, I, and we spoke earlier, I, I live outside of Detroit. Um, Detroit right now has just been taken over by the state of Michigan. Um, it is, a, it, a, and I'm just saying this for members of our audience who might not think about Detroit every day, um, that you know, it, 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 is, it is the symbol of, of urban failure, possibly globally, but certainly in this country. And I want to ask both of you what you would do about Detroit. And Bill, I'll start with, with you. What would you do, just briefly, what would you do to, to, to make Detroit greener and functional in a way that it, it isn't now? And I know you, you, you worked in Dearborn. You okay, probably have yeah. some thoughts. Well, I would do the kind of thing Mayor Daley did. I would convene, bring people together, and I would do like the Kurt Sheba did. This is an odd evocation, but I think it's really essential. The real fundamental question that we have today as design is how do we love all the children of all species for all time? The, the question is about the kids and what jobs do they have? What hope do they have? Because it starts there. That's where the devastation will come from, is the people losing any hope. <clears throat> they become desperate, they become mean, it becomes terrifying. So we start with that. And that's why if, when Kurt Sheba made every decision, the question Jaime Lerner asked was, how do I love my children, you see? So when they built libraries, instead of building a mausoleum downtown for books, he put them in all the little communities so every kid could get there in 12 minutes. And then the citizens complained because the people in the favelas outside the city limits were sending their children in to use the libraries inside Curitiba. And he had to stop that. And he said, why would I stop that? Are you kidding? If we don't love those children too, those children will grow up and hate the city. And if they grow up and hate the city, they will come in and destroy the city. So I start with those kids. And, and we could talk about, if you're going to start spending federal money, I mean, when I hear $5 billion for, you know, for an LNG thing, or when I hear politicians get up during the election and say, I think we should have energy security in America, I agree completely. Energy independence, absolutely. I think we should use public lands so we can have energy independence. I say, absolutely. I think we should drill in Montana. Absolutely not. Okay? I think we have a pipeline from Alberta to, to Texas. Absolutely not. What do you want? Eminent domain? Really? I thought you guys were into, never mind. Anyway. We, we used eminent domain already, as he pointed out, to build a federal highway system. It was a security system for our cities. Right. And Eisenhower did it, and it was get out of there in a hurry with a nuclear blast and mobilize our forces if yeah. we need to. And People we built a that. highway system. Right. And guess what? It's public real estate, and it's ready for solar collectors. Let's go. Yeah. Mayor Daly, if, 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 and, I, and tell us about what you're doing in Gary, because I guess that's kind of relevant to the Detroit question. But, but if, what would you do? Yeah, first, and you need the history of uh, uh, Detroit, the great contribution they've given to us. And then in turn, I, I tell them you take all the historical buildings down there, take your federal money, restore them, and you have many universities, and do housing for students, and housing uh, for uh, the professors and the staff people. You'll create a mass down there. You start getting boutiques and younger people, families coming down. Then in turn, you take the, the rest of the property there and you evaluate that. The most expensive uh, property is along the water to Gross Point. Then you look at what type of house you're gonna build there. Then start building, then move some of the people. There's like one home on a block. Then you start moving people into better housing. 
uh, affordable housing. Then you create the most environmentally technology city in the world. You go to Bill and say, here, we want to do something different for new manufacturing in the automobile industry and in the chemical industry, all these industries, and make that the center point of the Midwest. That's what I would do. I'd like to get open up for questions. Um, if there are any, I've got to do this the, again. I can make one more point. In Gary, yeah. Indiana, my, I lecture at University of Chicago, so I'm my graduate, undergraduate, helping Gary, Indiana, 85,000 people. We put foundation, the other universities behind it, give them experience. They become the advisors to a newly elected mayor, Harvard graduate lawyer, African American woman, honesty. It's exciting because we should never give up on people or part of a country. Uh, part of our country. We've given up on Detroit and Gary. They're all over, and we should not do that. We, we as a nation, can do much better to restore those urban communities in order to protect the environment. And last point, I think it's important mixed use and live work. Just remember that. For transportation, if you don't have to go somewhere because the factories aren't dangerous, we've done five textile mills where the water coming out is So instead of having the factory over here, yeah. the housing right. over I mean, here. Mix it all up yeah. and get the kids in there. And well, have and a that's, a, that's a cultural shift for yeah. sure. Uh, we have questions? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, there I saw you first and then over in this direction. Um, when you're t I'm sorry, I came in late. So when you're talking about green roofs, are you speaking of roofs with things growing on them? Or are you talking primarily about non-reflective roofs or well, white roofs or something. We're right. talking about things that insulate the roof, produce oxygen, provide bird habitat. Um, we're also talking about farming. And uh, we're doing a whole series of projects right now where the, all the roofs of the city, imagine Paris no. with growing its own food. Imagine on the roofs, imagine that. In, in the city of Chicago, we have the largest beehives on public roofs. And what we did there is we have a re-entry program, ex-offender program, uh, to basically deal with uh, the honey and everything else. And it's a training program. And it's amazing. And you start telling people uh, how all of a sudden uh, there's butterflies and, and everything else on top of uh, City Hall and other public buildings. It, it, and then all the values of buildings around looking down increase uh, you know, in, in know residential or office buildings. I know Chicago delivers a lot of different products to the world, but honey was not one that was on yes. my list. Maybe Do you I, believe I, that? We have the best honey because of the lake effect. Makes sense. That's Is there another question? Promoter. I'm just, you want to buy any honey? No. <laughs> See him afterwards. Um, yes. What, what a thrill to be quoted by Bill McDonough, <laughs> first off. And to the assembled uh, colleagues, let me just say, it's the dreamers who turn everything upside down. So when you hear these ideas to all the colleagues, I would say they sound crazy until they're not. And so thank you. Right. Uh, my, uh, my question to you, maybe it's a bit of a challenge question. You know, I have kids, many of us in the audience have children. Uh, schools have become a vault. How can we use city regulations and architectures to open up children's schools and become more a part of the community? Right, I, I took responsibility in 1995 and it wasn't part of the community. It, it, it was isolation. It was like a prison system. So what we did is, First of all, I started landscaping. In, in landscaping, I had the students adopt, each class adopt trees, and taking rid of the asphalt, or, or take it, make it environmentally friendly. And then, especially in the new construction, in making sure that all the uh, added activities of the school could be used on weekends and after school. And of course, my wife cited the largest after school program. In, in making a school a, a, a community center and not just an educational institution in creating a learning environment during school, after school, and weekends. There must be created a learning environment, and you have to open those schools, whether in a suburban or a city. You take suburban schools, they're only used uh, less than 40 hours a week. Unless you're on the football team or the, the swimming team, they're not used by the community. And from my viewpoint, that's creating a learning environment. That would get our children much more active in cultural and sports and become really part of a community instead of just all leaving school as quickly as possible. So I try to make the school a community center. And to me, that is the issue, uh, in, especially in big cities. And the reason why people leave big cities today is a lack of good quality public education. I'll be very frank. I mean, you talk to anyone, and that's why I start talking about middle class schools. I mean, you thought, what do you mean middle class school? Yes, we can create middle class schools with 25% kids on scholarship 
who are poor, mixed uh, racial, ethnic, religious, and you can make that a quality school. But unfortunately, that's why you have the suburban sprawl. They're moving out, out of the cities and farther out of the inner part of the suburban area for better schools. And that's why, to me, everyone has to take responsibility for Go ahead. I think the question of this conversation on Green Cities is focused on that question alone. These children, imagine a city where the monarch butterfly has been announced that we're down to 2.9 acres in Mexico from 20, some, 29, 20 years ago. Right. The Annenberg Foundation created an app for kids to track monarch butterflies about four years ago. There are now 900 thousand children in America tracking the monarchs on their smartphones. The children love those butterflies. Why are the monarchs decimated? Because the way we do herbicides in, in our farming, we no longer have weeds because we have Roundup Ready everything. And so all the milkweed are dead. So Chicago could take that verge and say, what we used to call weeds is now monarch habitat. Mm -hmm. Redefine it. Cities are more biodiverse than farming. Right. Big time. So what if a city restores biodiversity? What if we say, what birds fly overhead? Welcome them home. You know, what butterflies are here? Let well, those kids in those schools be in a world artists. bigger than they are. Yeah. And get rid of that asphalt, because it is two words assigning blame in this context. <laughs> is, there, is, there another, <laughs> is there another question? I have to remember that line. <laughs> uh, another question. I'm sorry, it's really hard for me to see. Over here. There you go, sorry. Um, it's Truman Siemens from Green Order and Cleantech Group. Uh, part of the ecosystem of a city is the is the the economic ecosystem, and all mm -hmm. that's that's all the flows in and out. Has a lot to do with the transportation. Has a lot to do with the jobs. And I wonder what the the opportunity is to uh, to redesign cities, um, trying to kind of take locavore to the ultimate and produce as much as possible of of everything that's needed, products and services within the city, what are the ways that a, that a city could, could do that, could approach that and really try to have as much of its economy internally producing the jobs, everything that is needed within that environment? Well, if you see the way the cities were built, they had manufacturing districts. And I live next to the stockyards and manufacturing. And, and what was isolated. And so those communities around it really worked in there. What's going to happen is the manufacturing is going to change because of technology and the environment. You're going to manufacturing in office buildings. It's not what you think building cars and trucks and everything. Besides some type of manufacturing, which is environmentally friendly, has technicians. You don't send your child to a vocational school. You don't send your child to work in a factory. You send your child to be a technician. And people understand that. And so from my viewpoint, that's how you have to look at the city completely different in this century than the last century. Don't repeat all the mistakes of the last century. And that's what Bill's pointed out. We have to look completely different in this century, and we're not. We're the same way we're trying to look at each issue separate. Education is not separate from the environment. It is not separate from business. And so from my viewpoint, the cities have to change. And this is a great opportunity for Gary, Indiana, or Detroit to show that it can be done. And you can create opportunities, and you can create jobs, for all types of people, from the lowest end to the highest end, in regards to employable uh, positions in their cities. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you both, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.